Well, thank you, Roger, for that uh, introduction and for putting my presentation in a broader context. And I want to thank the Manhattan Institute for this opportunity as well, and to Jim Pearson, who has uh, done so much to create shelters on campuses uh, for people like me. Um, I'm located at an Olin Institute at Harvard at this, uh, <clears throat> at this very moment, so this comes very much from the heart. Uh, it's a bit ironic to be speaking at the Yale Club now that I am based at Harvard. Uh, I'm reminded of JFK's uh, famous quip when he received an honorary degree from, from Yale. Now he said, um, I have the best of both worlds, a Harvard education and a Yale degree. Um, uh, um, in fact, I have the best of three worlds, um, a Princeton education, a Harvard appointment, and this afternoon, Yale's rented podium. Um, and I hope this, uh, this trifecta assures that at the very least, uh, the views I express here on the state of Middle Eastern studies won't be ignored. Now, five years have passed uh, since publication of my short book, Ivory Towers on Sand, The Failure of Middle Eastern Studies in America. Uh, more precisely, it appeared six weeks after 9-11. Uh, it was a case of perfect timing, and like most instances of perfect timing, it was by accident and not by design. Uh, I wrote it expecting it would be read only within academe, uh, but 9-11 amplified it a hundredfold, and it became the subject of articles in the New York Times, the New Republic, Foreign Affairs, and other publications. That's why, from time to time, admirers of the book tell me I should write a sequel or update it. Hit him again is their message. Uh, what these people don't realize is that I and others never stopped hitting them. And over the past five years, we've built on the foundation of that book to begin to change the way the Middle East is represented in our universities. We've made progress, but most of the work is still ahead of us, and we're entering what I think is a crucial phase. And what I intend to do briefly this afternoon is to demonstrate how, on three major fronts, we've made gains and then suggest where we might press forward next. But first, what are Middle Eastern studies? Uh, and where did they go wrong? Well, the study of the modern Middle East in American universities dates back to the Second World War. Uh, Middle Eastern studies developed as a branch of area studies which took off after the United States assumed its post-war dominance in world affairs. The federal government stimulated their growth with subsidies for Middle East centers and for fellowships. Uh, and by the 1960s, universities like Princeton, Harvard, Michigan, and Berkeley were stocked with social scientists and historians working on aspects of the Middle East. Many of them were imported for Europe, such as my professor Bernard Lewis, and generally speaking, they formed a serious scholarly guild, one which rewarded proficiency and demonstrated exp expertise. And so it was when I was a student in the 1970s. But in the 1980s and 90s, Middle Eastern studies were transformed into a field where scholarship took a back seat to advocacy, where a few biases became the highest credentials where dissenting views became thought crimes. Now this transformation I attribute to the influence of the late Professor Edward Said of Columbia University. In Said's famous book, Orientalism, he threw out the old definitions of expertise and proposed a radical new one. Said argued that Western experts, knowingly or not, distorted their subject and serviced imperialism. But Said promised salvation. A scholar could be redeemed by displaying political sympathy for the cause and the struggle. The cause was the empowerment of Palestinians, Arabs, Muslims. The struggle was against an axis of evil comprised of Western Orientalism, American imperialism, and Israeli Zionism. In the 1980s and 90s, Said's new orthodoxy swept through Middle Eastern studies, carried on the shoulders of radicals 
and Middle Eastern academics who made their way through the grad schools and into faculty positions. <coughs> Middle Eastern studies under their domination became very much like Middle Eastern regimes, that is, full of rhetoric about liberation, but dead set against all expressions of dissent. Now, if they'd been consistently right about the Middle East, it would be one thing. But in fact, and this was the substance of my book, they'd been consistently wrong. And most famously, they had a tendency to downplay the ferocity of radical Islam. Said himself led the way. At one point before 9-11, mocking, and I quote, speculations about the latest conspiracy to blow up buildings, sabotage commercial line airliners, and poison water supplies, end of quote. Such talk, he said, was based on highly exaggerated stereotyping. Now, this approach helped to lull America into the complacency that made 9-11 possible. Now, since 9-11, America has been at war in the Middle East. The vast majority of academic experts on the Middle East have opposed this war, and many of them feel vindicated by all that's gone wrong in Iraq. Now, this isn't the place to go into the Iraq war debate and who got what right. Uh, it's not so simple. But certainly it's created a sense in Middle Eastern studies that the wheel has turned back in their favor. So why haven't they been shouting it from the rooftops? Why aren't they holding anti-war teach-ins? A few do, but the vast majority don't. Why the restraint? The answer, ladies and gentlemen, is a simple one. The leaders of Middle Eastern studies may be radicals, but they know a golden opportunity when they see one, and they see one right now. Since 9-11 and the Iraq War, interest in the Middle East has reached unprecedented heights. For the first time in America's history, the Middle East is at the top of this nation's foreign policy concerns. And this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for Middle Eastern studies to grow big, like Soviet studies did, during the Cold War. In Middle Eastern studies, they know what they want. They want government to pour in new resources. They want universities to expand their programs. They want promotions or upgrades to better universities. And they want their favored grad students to get the best job offers. Uh, but you can't grow big if you draw too much controversy. So the cooler heads in Middle Eastern studies have prevailed of late, and they're busy dissimulating. They want America to believe that they're part of the solution, not part of the problem. That America, to paraphrase, should go to war with the Middle Eastern studies it has, not the Middle Eastern studies it would like to have. Now, I don't think I'm alone in believing that that's just not good enough. If the United States can't deepen its cultural knowledge of the Middle East, can't expand the pool of people who know Arabic and Persian, and can't find recruits among them who care more about our future than that of, say, the Palestinians, then the United States is unlikely to win this or any war. So for myself and others, in the days and weeks following 9-11, a practical agenda emerged. It included these three elements. First, prevent a windfall increase in federal funding for Middle Eastern studies by placing a giant question mark next to the program that funds it. Second, prevent the worst offending professors from moving up, or moving up their grad students into plum jobs especially at flagship universities. And third, to help create alternatives inside the academy, opening space through new programs, endowments, and appointments. So how have we done? Let's start with the first objective, 
prevent a windfall increase in federal funding for Middle Eastern studies by placing a question mark next to the program that funds it. That program is known as Title VI after a section of the Higher Education Act. Most taxpayers don't realize how extensively the government funds Middle Eastern studies. Um, a student doing a PhD on 16th century Venice probably isn't going to get a federal subsidy. But a student working on 16th century Cairo almost certainly will because his research will be conducted in a critical language, that is Arabic. And it's federal money that also pays for the 17 national resource centers for the Middle East which are situated on university campuses. After 9-11, we managed to get a congressional hearing on Title VI and even put a provision for a Title VI advisory board in the drafts of the Higher Ed Act reauthorization. But the Academy rallied. They painted us as enemies of academic freedom, and they effectively quashed the legislation. But lately, however, and this will be news, we have regained the initiative. Uh, when the Bush administration decided in late 2005 to propose a major investment in the study of so-called critical languages like Arabic, Chinese, they'd noticed the flap that we caused around Title VI, and so they completely went around it. The administration instead launched something called the National Security Language Initiative, or Nestle, which bypasses Title VI. Its focus is on promoting early acquisition of critical languages in the K-12 system. When fully appropriated, Nestle will be as large as Title VI, and this move has stunned the area studies establishment. There's been a 9-11 windfall, but they didn't get it. On, uh, on top of that, Title VI reform is back on the agenda. Uh, when the advisory board idea died, Congress asked the prestigious National Academies to do a review of Title VI. The academic establishment expected the review would praise the program and call for more funding, and I thought it would too, although I still accepted an invitation to address the review panel. Imagine the astonishment then when the final report released two weeks ago described Title VI as a program lost at sea, lacking accountability and performance measurements. The oversight mechanisms now proposed by the national academies exceed anything that we imagined. If Congress implements the review's recommendations, Title VI will be transformed. And until its reform is implemented, it's unlikely its appropriations will be increased. So check that box. Objective two was to prevent the worst offending professors from moving up <coughs> or bringing in their clones, especially at top universities. Now, since 9-11, increased enrollments have persuaded many provosts and deans that they have to expand their Middle East offerings and programs. And the Middle East studies mandarins have put themselves and their students forward for the new openings. But all the controversy around Middle Eastern studies has put university administrators on high alert. More than my book, the scandal in the Middle East Department at Columbia served as a wake-up call. Now, we remember that episode as a case of faculty harassment of students who held pro-Israel views. But it happened at Columbia because radical Middle East faculty were given carte blanche to appoint and tenure their allies and their acolytes. Since the Columbia affair, every university president has wondered whether he or she has a similar time bomb ticking on some corridor. And as a result, Middle East appointments are getting microscopic scrutiny. The cases of two past presidents of the Middle East Studies Association exemplify what's changed. Case one, uh, I didn't mention Juan Cole of the University of Michigan in my book. He was obscure before 9-11. Post 9-11, he blogged his way to internet fame by posting anti-war agitprop in the guise of expertise. Last year, he tried to trade up from Michigan to Yale, uh, where a search committee comprised of his friends put him forward 
for a prestigious new position. A controversy ensued, which carried over into the Wall Street Journal, where you may have seen it, and a higher university committee finally nixed him. That coal could be shot down was a devastating blow to the Middle East Studies establishment, a sign that their own judgment of who's best in their own field doesn't carry any weight within academe itself. Case two. Stanford, like Yale, has never been strong in the modern Middle East, and it's been keen to build itself up. But it's had a problem. It's saddled with Joel Bainan, one of the most extreme academics <laughs> in, in Middle Eastern studies. <clears throat> Uh, so Stanford wisely decided to freeze its expansion plans until it could freeze Bainan out. At which point this past year, Bainan, in a huff, decamped for the American University in Cairo to run a Middle East center there. Bainan has said, and I quote, I'm away because Stanford has demonstrated over the course of more than two decades that it has at best minimal institutional interest in the study and teaching of the modern Middle East, end of quote. Well, that's untrue. What is true is that Stanford isn't prepared to allow Bainan to preside over the expansion. So the trade-ups and the jobs for the boys, the rewards of relevance, have been partly denied even to the presidents of the Middle East Studies Association. Crucial to that process has been the effort made by outsiders who've put together dossiers the tenure committees can't ignore. But in the end, the rewards are being held back by the self-regulatory mechanisms of the universities themselves. So check that box. I come now to the third and last objective. Create alternatives inside the academy through programs, endowments, and appointments. At the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen, it's not enough to blockade funds in Congress and deny appointments to agit profs. People and resources have to be mobilized to offer universities credible alternatives. This is just what some foreign governments and individuals are doing. I mean, Middle Eastern studies have always been a magnet for Arab money, uh, and they've become so once more. Last year, Harvard and Georgetown each accepted $20 million from Saudi Prince Al-Walid to expand Islamic studies. Uh, you remember him, he gave the New York Fireman's Fund uh, $10 million after 9-11 and Giuliani gave the check back when the prince blamed 9-11 on US support for Israel. Harvard will add four new chairs with that money and lest you think this is unseemly, I remind you that Al-Walid's Harvard gift is credited to the bottom line of the Larry Summers presidency. Um, in academe, princes bearing gifts aren't turned away by anyone. Uh, it's here that I'm concerned that not enough foundations and donors get it. Uh, the Jewish ones have begun to fund and endow new programs and shares in Israel studies. That's all well and good for the study of Israel. But where does that leave the study of the rest of the Middle East, from Morocco through Iraq and to Afghanistan? Where does that leave the study of Islam? Where does that leave the study of US interests and strategy in the Middle East? I remind you that many of the bad ideas that you encounter inside the Beltway rest ultimately on the conventional wisdom of Middle Eastern studies. Now here's a sampling. If we'd only change our policy toward Israel, we'd be loved and admired in the Arab Islamic street. Islamism can be moderated through inclusion in the political process. In any case, the triumph of the Islamists is inevitable and we should accommodate them. Regimes like Iran and Syria could be our partners if only we'd meet them halfway. And above all, the use of force anywhere in the Middle East is always, always counterproductive. Now, Middle Eastern studies aren't just a hatchery for these ideas. They validate them, place them over and beneath the logos of top universities, give them an aura of scholarship. 
And hard as some of the think tanks work to slay bad ideas, many of them still get through. They also get embedded in the minds of today's students, tomorrow's policymakers, diplomats, analysts, and journalists. So I conclude. What's needed isn't another expose of Middle Eastern studies by Martin Kramer. It's been done. What's needed is a strategic plan of investment derived from an understanding that the controversy has created an opportunity. Their prince has come. We still await ours. Thank you very much. <laughs>